With anyone starting this video, I suggest that you go back to part one to get up to speed of what's going to be added to this video. I left off at the last video with Tom Hunt and Jesse James being the same man. Before I get into that trial and what took place there, I'd like to go back a year earlier. The Mammoth Cave stage robbery happened in 1880, uh, September 3rd, and I'd like to go back to Joplin, Missouri, November 3rd, 1879. In fact, actually just outside of Joplin at a place called Shoal Creek. What hasn't been widely known and still isn't today is that this is the place where Jesse tried his first hoax. On November 3rd, at an area called Shoal Creek, there was a doctor that was making a house call. When he came along with his buggy, and he heard a few shots up ahead. A few minutes later, two riders come riding past and hollered at the doctor that they believe there's a man hurt and somebody dead up ahead. The one man that passed, the doctor noticed that he was bleeding severely from the leg. As the doctor proceeded up the road, he found a man that was wounded, but he didn't find a body. He tended to a couple of men that were injured and later on reported back to authorities back in Joplin. A search went out the following day for this man that was killed. George Shepard is the man that the doctors spotted that came running past that was shot in the leg. He went riding on to claim that he was the one that had killed Jesse James, that he had shot him through the head and was sure he was dead. Later, another gang member named Jim Cummings would ride behind George Shepard and would validate Shepard's story that Jesse was killed by Shepard. As the doctor returned to town and had told his story, he was given a description of what Jesse James looked like and the doctor was sure Jesse was one of the men that he attended to with a wound to his side. George Shepard tried to convince anybody that would listen that he had killed Jesse. And Jim Cummings would be right, right there to validate the story. This story went out across the country, all the way from San Francisco, all the way east of Philadelphia. This is a known story, but very few historians have ever included this. This was his first hoax. There was a body that was sent from Joplin to Kansas City. And the papers reported that the coffin is supposed to contain the body of Jesse James. The doctor coming along foiled this hoax. A lot of people don't know of this story, but it can be found with just a little research. So at this time we can see that Jesse was already trying to hoax his death. And if it hadn't been for the doctor, he would have got away with it. Now notice that the two men that I mentioned, Jim Cummings and George Shepard, are two known guerrillas and gang members that were helping Jesse with this hoax. There would also be Dick Little by his own admission later on that he was at this shooting. Dick Little would also have a hand in the next hoax and that would be at the Mammoth Cave stage robbery. I said we'd come back to that robbery. It's almost one year later that two men robbed two stages. This is on September 3rd, 1880. One going to the cave and the other back to Cave City. On the first robbery, it contained several passengers on that stage. And R.H. Roundtree, and I want to mention R.H. Roundtree because he is the key to the whole hoax. This hoax was well thought out, not like the first hoax that was more of a spare of the moment decision. People need to remember that Jesse basically had law enforcement and judges and other officials pretty well paid for and in his pocket. This is how they were able to reign for almost 16 years. They had a 
fine organization. I have said in some of my presentations that Al Capone probably would have been envious of the organization that they had set up. Frank and Jesse and several other members were political operatives, not common thieves. This is basically their, their job. So at the Mammoth Cave stage robbery, I've noted before that R.H. Roundtree is a key to this hoax. R.H. Roundtree reported that he had lost his watch and key, and that watch and key is one of the things they use as prime evidence that Jeff Z was killed in St. Joe, Missouri. Also on the stage was R.H. Roundtree's daughter and his nephew and two other passengers. They all gave descriptions of the two robbers. On the second stage that was robbed, there were two passengers and a, dr and a driver. And one of their passengers was a man named Newton Gassaway. Like I remember Newt Newton Gassaway gave one of the most complete descriptions of the men that robbed the stage. And by his description, later, a G.W. Bunger, who was the deputy sheriff of Ohio County, Kentucky, suspected two coal miners, one who called himself Thomas J. Hunt. As I stated in a previous video, this cannot be Thomas J. Hunt. Thomas J. Hunt was executed in the fall of 1864. Here is a plaque on the spot where the four guerrillas were executed. Thomas J. Hunt rode with Quantrill back in Missouri and also in Kentucky. I know I'm recovering some of the old ground that I covered in the first video, but I wanted to show this plaque. Now others think that this Thomas J. Hunt, there's a, it's a different hunt. It is not. I've checked the roster Quantrell's roster and it is Thomas J. Hunt and Thomas J. Hunt is the name Jesse used during the trial for the Mammoth Cave robbery. The two passengers that were on the second stage as I said before gave a great description and part of that description was that Jesse had moles on the right cheek and had a mole on the nose just below the eye. And I would like to show you one picture, known picture of Jesse that you've seen in the first video. And you can clearly see the two moles on the cheek and you see the mole on the nose right below the eye. To confirm this mole just below the eye in the photograph that I own, I'll bring it up. The known picture here is Jesse on the left and my picture of Jesse on the right. You can clearly see the two moles on the cheek on each photo and a mole on the nose just below the eye. All the passengers on the stage were convinced the men that Bunger brought in was the man that robbed the stage. Just before the trial, after Bunger, deputy sheriff, brought in Hunt, Hunt was assigned a defense attorney to try to find an alibi for Hunt and his whereabouts at this time. As he went up to the area from where Hunt said he had lived, he only found that neighbors said that he was away at that time of the robbery and others had seen Hunt in the area the day 
of the robberies. Now, if folks aren't still aren't sure if this is Jesse James, I've done further research in the census that was taken in 1880. Hunt had claimed at the time that him and his brother had been living in Ohio County for the past five years. Yet in the census of 1880, there is no mention of Thomas Hunt. I would like to show two side-by-sides of known pictures of Jesse and the picture that was taken of Hunt at the time of the trial. On the left is young Jesse taken somewhere around 1867. And I want to point out now that I have a side by side, which I didn't on the first video, so you can take a look at the two together. On the first picture of Jesse, you can see the two moles on the side of the cheek. If you slide over to Tom Hunt, you see exactly the same two moles. If you go below the lip, you'll see two moles just below the lip on Hunt. Exactly the same two moles that are on Jesse. But it doesn't stop there. There are two prominent moles side by side on the neck and again you get to see those same two exact moles on Tom Hunt. This is not Tom Hunt. This is Jesse James. No two men could possibly have all this arrangement of moles without being the same person. And especially two men that would have known each other. Here's another side by side, which again shows the two moles. The photo on the right is a known picture taken at Barrel Stave Factory back in 1880. And again, you see those two moles. You same, see those exact same two moles on Hunt. There's another prominent mole on the lower cheek, almost even with the mouth. And again, you see the same mole on the cheek. When Hunt was brought in, almost all of the passengers agreed this was the man that had robbed them. Except for one, wasn't quite sure. And this is what I'm talking about, the key to the conspiracy. And that's R.H. Roundtree. He wasn't sure. He's the one that lost the watch. At the conclusion of the trial, Hunt was found, found guilty in the criminal court and also in the circuit court. He was sentenced to three years in Kentucky State Prison. On the very same day that Hunt is sentenced, Roundtree said that he had returned home where awaited him with two letters laying on his desk, both from Missouri, one coming from Jefferson City and the other from Kansas City. The one letter 
came from Clarence Height stating that Jesse, they needed to turn Tom Hunt loose and Jesse was there in Missouri. Now Clarence Height is a cousin to Jesse. I find it hard that Clarence would tell authorities where Jesse is at. Clarence was serving time in a penitentiary at this time. The other letter came from Kansas City and there we find Dick Little sending a letter, a confession, saying that Jesse was still in Missouri and he had the watch that came from R.H. Roundtree. Remember Dick Little is the same one that was involved in the first hoax. So now you have ex-guerrillas and gang members involved in both hoaxes. This all happened on April 1st, 1882, just two days before the supposed assassination of Jesse in Missouri, which they found a watch that came from R.H. Roundtree. We now know with all the guerrillas testifying to all this, this is all a hoax. Jesse was pardoned after that, and he was also paid by the state of Kentucky restitution of $1,500. So not only did he do the crime, he was also paid for it. So at this time, I would like to reinforce that Tom Hunt would have known and rode with Jesse. Jesse used his comrade's name to pull this hoax. And this is no other Thomas J. Hunt. Is Thomas J. Hunt is the gorilla that they rode with and the gorilla they executed and the gorilla he claimed to be. So I'd like to kind of circle around back and get back to J. Frank Dalton. So out of all of this, who is J. Frank Dalton? I said we would come back to him. That's where we started. And I'm going to let you know a few things that you will agree that J. Frank Dalton is not a complete hoaxer. Back in 2000, Bud Hardcastle of Purcell, Oklahoma, along with James' family members, wanted to exhume the body of J. Frank Dalton to conduct a DNA test. On May 30, 2000, an order of the court was given to exhume the body. As they uncovered the grave, they not only found one coffin, but two. One of the coffin, and these two coffins were only 18 inches apart. At that time, a Miss Pen Penny Owen was there reporting on the exhumation. Miss Penny Owen was from the Daily Oklahoman and was a crime investigative reporter. Now you got to keep in mind Miss Owen has no dog in this fight. She only reported what she had seen. And she reported, and I'm going to put it up so you can read part of it, part of her report, and it can be found. And this is only part of it and you can read her full report. One of the caskets was in a sealed vault, which was unexpected because records showed that the body was buried. Now they're talking about J. Frank Dalton was buried in a cloth covered redwood casket. The sealed vault casket was clearly marked 
Jesse James, however, the second casket found about 18 inches away was wooden but unmarked. I have a photograph at the gravesite at this time and you can see the vault. Now she reported it was clearly marked Jesse James, yet she knows the record show J. Frank Dalton was buried in a redwood casket. The sealed vault casket was moved to an undisclosed area and would be opened up for the DNA test. As they opened the casket, they would seen that they would made a terrible mistake. This cannot be J. Frank Dalton. This corpse only has one arm. Why then is the, is the casket marked Jesse James? I think you're going to be shocked to see what I've uncovered. Here's a photograph that's believed to be taken in Fletcher, Oklahoma when Frank James was living in that area. Frank is the one in the middle holding the dog. And if you notice on the left stands a man with one arm. His sleeve is pinned to his coat. Again here in this photograph is another photograph, known photograph of Frank. And again you see a man with one arm. Sharp turned up nose and a mole on that cheek. Now historians want to tell you that this is one John Poole. John Poole isn't missing either one of his arms and is not bald. Here's another photograph taken at the same time and again you can see that arm missing. In fact somebody's tried to cover this and has inked out at the bottom of that arm to make it look like he's held in his arm in back of him, but you can clearly see there's no arm in that sleeve. So we know now, presuming that J. Frank Dalton is in a wooden casket right alongside the steel casket that's marked Jesse James. J. Frank Dalton knew within inches or where Jesse was buried. J. Frank Dalton is not Jesse James. At least he's not Frank James' brother. I have some photos here. I believe will show you who J. Frank Dalton was as a young gorilla during the Civil War. And you can compare these for yourself. This is a photo J. Frank Dalton after he was bedridden and a couple characteristics I want you to know or look at his right eyebrow comes down at a heavy slant and the whites of his eye are dark. He has a long pointed nose and a mole just outside of his mustache. Keep these characteristics in mind as I'll show you the next photograph. As you can see here, the same exact characteristics as J. Frank Dalton. The heavy eyebrow that comes across this eye. The darkening of the white of the eye. The long pointed nose. And the mole just above the lip. Exact position. This is J. Frank Dalton without a doubt. Here's another photograph of J. Frank Dalton and again you can see the darkness of this eye, the mole right behind, uh, underneath the eye, the long pointed nose, 
and clearly see the mole just outside the mustache. So now we know that J. Frank Dalton wasn't completely a hoaxer. In these two videos, I have given only the facts, not theory or hearsay. No one has ever exposed the Jameses like this before. I think this closes the door on Jesse, James, Jesse and Frank James. If you have any questions about any of these two videos, please leave it in the comments sections and I would be more than glad to answer any, any questions.